Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this, the final against the spread podcast until the 2024 football season. We're back in July. We've got a bunch of for you We're going to always do the info from thelogicalapproach.com. Tony Mejia, a playbook expert and a contributing writer for Sporting News, our executive producer Greg De Palma from Crime Sports, and also leading off the show will be Jordan Reed from uwager.lv. And today, guys, we're going to talk about the because Greg is a big contributor to the draft with the U lads, or our lads, I should say, our lads draft preview guy, which is absolutely the best the best bar none out there. So we're going to get Greg's opinion there that, that way as well. And we're also going to close out with a little bit of a preview of the 2024 football season from both the college and the NFL football perspective sides. So a big, big show we've got on tap for you today. And as always, our show is being brought to you by our good friends at uwager.lv, the only offshore sports book that I, Mark Lawrence, personally endorse. You can also pick up free same-day payouts at uwager.lv. Give them a call toll-free. The number is 1-800-U-WAGER or log on at uwager.lv. And with that, Jordan, I'm going to welcome you into the show. And I want to check with you, first of all, now that the March Madness is in the rearview mirror and the NBA playoffs are here now, the NFL draft is gone. As a football fan, were you excited about the draft? Was there anything that happened that caught you off guard, particularly aside from, let's say, the Michael Penix thing? Because I think that was the obvious, Michael Penix being drafted where he was. But all in all, your take on the NFL draft. Uh, that was the easiest one, Michael Penix, right? Uh, yes, the NFL draft was really exciting. We took draft props on it, uh, got some calls. Uh, I thought the draft went really, really well. I think um, Bo Nix... Uh, going what 12th overall was a little bit uh surprising as well as always the quarterbacks get pushed higher up the board but um them waiting so long on a defensive player that was another one that i found a little bit surprising and of course the dolphins um i felt like they got a little cute with their selection well is that a little bit of a dolphin dolphin love for you on your part do you like the miami dolphins or was that just a an opinion without politics involved no, no, I like the Dolphins for sure. I understand. <laughs> you can tell from behind me. I get you. I get you totally. I'm down here in Miami, so I get exactly what it is that you're saying. And uh, just a little sidebar note to our listeners out there. This is a great little stat that I came across. Uh, with Caleb Williams going as the first quarterback in the draft, uh, this was reported that over the last 24 times the first quarterback in the draft has made his first start as an NFL football quarterback. Those teams are 3 20 and one outright in those football games. We don't know yet who the Chicago Bears are playing in their season opening game. We know their opponents. We just don't know the schedule as of yet, but keep that stat in mind, three, 20, and one, a big hurdle for Caleb Williams to have to overcome, at least in that first start, to say the, to say the least. Jordan, I know there's some football props that are out there now, and hundreds of more are going to come as we get closer and closer, obviously, to the football season here for the 2024 season. Which of those do you feel are the nuts a prop out there that a person should not overlook as far as betting props goes maybe either from a value standpoint right now or for something that you yourself particularly like oh with free agency uh, be, being over and uh we get the super bowl odds and the division odds coming out um uh, coming out now and you already with free agency in the draft you know who the teams are going to be essentially so it's a really good chance to jump on some of the early super bowl numbers even before the schedule comes out um and I like I like a lot of different um, different plays there. I mean, I generally take dogs with these early numbers because you don't know who they're going to be. Um, uh, the Jets, for one, uh, you can get the Jets at plus twenty seven hundred to make the Super Bowl. I like that, or to win the Super Bowl. I'm sorry. Well, you mean Aaron Rodgers to make the Super Bowl is what you mean, correct? Right. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> if he lasts that long, right? I understand. I understand. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the Jets, and was there anything else? I mean, I, I like the Jets for sure. Um, I like the Lions as well, plus 1,300. That's a good one. Um, and then uh, Chiefs, 49ers, pretty pretty safe bets to get back there. Not, I mean, there's no safe bet in this, but but they're, they're your lower odds, right? 
They are. Uh, I guess you'll be pushing the envelope a little bit with Kansas City, uh, looking the three-peat for the first time ever in National Football League history. But is the prop you're looking at for them to make the Super Bowl or win the Super Bowl? Which way are you looking at that? Uh, well, what I'm looking at right now is, is to win the Super Bowl, but I like the division and to make the Super Bowl props as well. And it also appears that, and we'll talk about this, that Kansas City enhan enhanced themselves in the draft. They did pretty well, uh, especially, I think, in the first round uh, when they did just that. Uh, are there any special offers? I know we're going into offseason here. We're going to be coming up on pro football before we know it. Uh, August is going to be here for preseason football. And what are some of the advantages people have when they log on and register at uwager.lv today and any special advantage offers that you're offering them as we're doing the show? Well, thanks for bringing that up. You mentioned uh, free same day payouts. We always have free same day payouts, which is huge. That's the most important thing, getting paid. Uh, on top of that, we have the best lines in the industry. Uh, going into baseball season, we're the only book with a true dime line all the way up to 190 so that's huge for that's, mlb that's, that's strong yes uh, best lines uh by far uh you can play with anonymity you don't have to pay taxes play for any of the, any state in the u.s and as far as promos right now we can use your promo code playbook to get 70 percent free play uh all with right. not a huge commitment it comes with a one-time rollover and no hold just to try us out you can you can get 70% on your first deposit, try us out, try out the lines, make a few uh, make a few bets or make one bet and take your payout and see how fast our payouts are. And we're pretty sure you're going to be coming back. Well, I highly encourage our listeners and our viewers out there to take advantage of that 70% offer. Just log on at uwager.lv or give them a call toll free at 1-800-U-WAGER. Use the promo code playbook and take advantage of that big 70% bonus offer being offered by Jordan Reed and the group at uwager.lv. Jordan, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna be rooting for you like the Miami Dolphins. I'm I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and my, my true blood is with the Cleveland Browns, but uh, I've been enhanced down here in South Florida here now for over 20 years, so I'm getting some dolphin blood in me, and I understand why. They just have to, I think, do a little better job on the coaching sideline staff of things this year, but that's my own personal opinion. <laughs> that too, for sure. Well, thanks for having me on again. Uh, big fan of the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. That was Jordan Reed joining us from uwager.lv, where you can pick up that big 70% bonus. That's a really great bonus, guys. Log on or call them 1-800-U-WAGER or log on at uwager.lv. Mention Playbook and get that big 70% bonus. And with that, guys, let's roll it over now to the National Football League draft. A little bit of an overview from the draft. And, uh, I'm going to ask Greg to chime in on with us, with Andy and Tony and myself uh, for the overview, because as I mentioned before, Greg is a big contributor to that Our Lads Draft Preview Guide, which is outstanding. And uh, Greg did a lot of great work for that preview guide, so I know he'll have some things to pass up here along the way as we're coming up here. I have to mention this, though. I have to give our kudos to the staff at playbooksports.com because we did really, really well again in our playbook mock draft this football season. And in fact, the last two years of the 64 players drafted in the first round, we've nailed 49 of those players and 190 out of 254 players the last nine, eight years, I should say. Uh, it was a kind of a unique draft to say the least. And uh, what we saw coming out of the draft here, the SEC obviously leading the way again this year. 59 players came out of the ACC this football draft, followed by the Pac-12, and kudos to the Pac-12. In their final year of existence, only the SEC had more players drafted from that conference. It was really talent-related this year was the Pac-12, and it was nice to see just that, uh, 12 players. You had the Big Ten. Uh, or I should say 43 players to the Pac-12. You had the Big Ten here with 42, the ACC with 41, and the Big 12 with 31 among the other Power Five or soon-to-be Power Four conferences from what we saw in the draft this year. Uh, I'm going to roll this over to you, Andy, here, and ask you your questions, your first thoughts on what happened to the National Football League draft this year. Well, Mark, for the most part, it went according to form, certainly amongst the top few picks. I think the surprise may have been, although it was not that much of a surprise, let's say for 48 hours leading into the draft, and that is the six quarterbacks taken in the first round. Perhaps the fact that the six were taken as early as they were might have been a surprise, but a lot of people who were uh, astute enough to get on the number over four and a half when that prop came out about 
three or four weeks ago uh, really uh, were prescient in uh, in uh, in forecasting uh, what might be a, a prop that would move. Um, now, for a long time, I've been talking about I did not like what the Bears did as far as trading away uh, Justin Fields. They had invested three years in him. He had shown decent progress in each of the three years, especially cutting down interceptions and increasing uh, his uh, uh, completion percentage, uh, and uh, as well, they had invested in him, as I mentioned. So now they're starting over by going to Caleb Williams, and we don't know what he's going to turn into. A lot of people were uh, were very high on him. It seemed to be the obvious uh, number one choice. I was a little concerned because he was not nearly as effective in 2023 as he was when he won the Heisman in 2022. And at the same time, uh, it's always going to be difficult for a rookie quarterback. At the same time, and part of the reason why I thought they should have held on to Fields, with the number one and number nine choices, they had great maneuverability. It turns out, that, and they already, that Williams is designed to succeed, considering the additions of Keenan Allen in the offseason and DJ Moore already on the roster. They've got some nice young running backs who have been productive. Justin Fields, of course, gave him the additional ability to run the ball, which is another option that you don't find in uh, in, in a majority of the quarterbacks this year. At the same time, had they kept fields and maybe even worked a trade down a few spots, they could have had Marvin Harrison, yet another outstanding running uh, receiver, one who many many experts believe was actually the best overall talent in the draft, regardless of position. And then they might have even been able to add tight end Brock uh, Bowers from Georgia, who was a very highly thought of and highly sought after. They could have been... Uh, they still might be very effective on offense, but they could have had one of the better offensive skill position units uh, in the NFL, which might have even lessened some of the pressure on the offensive line because of the running, the balanced running ability. So I still think they did well with the picks that they made with the other wide receiver that they got uh, with their uh, number nine pick. So overall, I would say you'd have to grade the Bears as uh, uh, as doing something positive. I did like the uh, the choice of Bo Nix uh by uh, uh, Denver at quarterback. Many people expected them to take a quarterback. They weren't quite sure who it was going to be. But, you know, if there's one coach in the NFL has sh- who has shown a great ability to work with quarterbacks and get the most and even more out of them than their, uh, than their let's call it, uh, textbook potential, it's Sean Payton. We saw what he did with Drew Brees, got him into the Hall of Fame, although he was on a pretty good career uh, before he went to New Orleans. But he cemented it with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with what he ended up putting up in his career. I thought both Buffalo and Kansas City address some significant needs and you alluded to uh, uh, Kansas City earlier with the addition of uh, their wide receiver which was a huge uh, lacking point in their offense this past year they still had a very good offense but below the production of previous years at the same time their defense was one of the best in the NFL this year under Steve Spagnola uh, so they addressed a major need Buffalo with the departure of, of, of Diggs I think also addressed a, a significant need. So I think that the strong actually got a bit stronger this year. And uh, that was uh, uh, that I thought was very much of a positive. I didn't really have too many. Uh, I, I can't really be too critical of a lot of teams because we don't know what their thinking was. I mean, I, Atlanta has come in for a lot of criticism with the choice of Michael Penix Jr., especially after signing uh, Cousins to the uh, huge quarter. I think it was a four-year contract with $100 million guaranteed. The thought is that they're going to let Penix sit. I think that the comment that came out, we're going to use the Green Bay model. When they drafted Jordan Love, they knew it was going to be ultimately to succeed Aaron Rodgers. Let him sit and learn for a few years. And I don't think that's a terrible idea with Penix Jr. because of his injury issues in the past. Seeing limited playing time, barring a significant injury to a Cousins, allows whatever injuries that he's had in the past to continue to heal even more with little subject to injury unless he's pressed into service. So while I think a lot of people disagreed with it and I might not have made that choice, I can understand their thinking. Now all they have to do is be as fortunate as Green Bay was, at least in Jordan Love's first year as a starter. Well, Andy, let me ask you here before I turn this over to Tony. Uh, what was your take on the biggest surprise of the first round. What surprised you the most other than the Michael Penix move? Uh, I, you know, I, I guess maybe just the limited number of trades, especially amongst the top teams in the draft with all those quarterbacks available and several teams in, in need of a quarterback. I was surprised that a team, well, let's put it this way. I'd say the, the Giants, A, that they didn't take a quarterback at all, Daniel Jones, who 
was not living up to uh, pre-draft expectations, although I remember I was very fond of the pick coming out of Duke. He had a nice career with a good quarterback uh, uh, as a coach, as his, uh, his head coach at, at, at Duke. But uh, the fact that he was injury prone and they really don't have quality backups, I was really surprised that the Giants did not do more to address what has been an injury, especially uh, with the departure of uh, uh, Saquon Barkley uh, as, as far. Now, they got a uh, decent running back, but not one that – comparable to Barkley, certainly if they stay injured, because Barkley did have some injury issues. So I think I was a bit surprised at what the Giants did, although I like the talent that they drafted. I'm not sure that they addressed uh, their most significant, uh, the, the most franchise's most significant concern when they're looking uh, to become a contender. And remember, it. remember the Giants were in the playoffs just two years ago before everything fell apart. So it's not as though they were significantly far behind making it back to the playoffs. True. Good point. Good point. Well, Tony, I'm going to say this uh, before I hand it over to you. Uh, my biggest surprise personally in the draft, other than the Michael Penix situation, was the fact that the Buffalo Bills got a Hall of Fame receiver in Xavier Worthy. And when I, you say Hall of Fame receiver, are you kidding me? The fact of the matter is Xavier Worthy is in the National Football League Hall of Fame. What they did was they put all of his artifacts, his shoes and everything from that 4.2140 that he ran, the fastest in history, and it's now in the Hall of Fame. So there is Xavier Worthy in the Hall of Fame. But uh, that aside, just the fact that Buffalo made uh, traded, I should say, to get that particular traded away and allowed, if you will, uh, the Chiefs to get Xavier Worthy. I can't understand for the life of me what they would have let Kansas City make a move like that for not so much that maybe they didn't like Worthy, Buffalo didn't, but why let Kansas City get him? Your your a your number one ace nemesis. That to me, that was to me the most surprising move in the draft. Tony. Well, I, I think that was addressed. I think that was addressed, and it was basically if if they don't trade with us to get him, they would have done it with somebody else. Which I, I mean, like again, that's that's uh, NFL politicking, so I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. But I mean, I would I would imagine that that's who uh, that's who the Chiefs were targeting, uh, and Buffalo liked the deal. I, I mean, like I definitely see what you're saying because that was a heavy subject of debate. Why would the Bills allow the Chiefs to uh, to help themselves? But if that's the if that's the answer, if you figured, uh, well, if they don't make that deal with us, they're going to strike it with somebody else, and that softens the blow a little bit. But I mean, look, the draft I thought was very entertaining, uh, if nothing else, and and my biggest surprise was the, the lack of defensive players in that first, what, 14, I guess it was, uh, yes. maybe even more, I, I forget the exact number, uh, but, you know, just going pick after pick after pick, uh, even even after Atlanta made the biggest surprise where they were supposed to take, uh, you know, a, a defensive player there early and went panics, which I, I didn't hate either. Um, and then uh, you, you still had the run of offensive tackles uh, and, and other offensive players, the, the quarterbacks with Knicks, before uh, a defensive player went in lot to, uh, to the Colts. Well, the Penix situation, I don't want to beat this like a drum because it's been talked over and rehashed probably more than any other move out of the draft. But uh, as uh, our lads called out that Michael Penix Jr. has had four season-ending injuries in his career. Uh, I think he's maybe had five seasons he's played in college football. Four of them were season-ending injuries. Do you think that should have factored into the decision about uh, backing Kirk Cousins up with a an L, I'm going to say elderly, a mature quarterback like Michael Penix that has injuries or is injury prone? I, I guess he'll be what twenty four this week. Yes, uh, at some point this week, either Friday or Saturday. So he's he's going to be an older rookie. I just think it, watching Desmond Ritter all last season, and, and I had I, I remember a top play that I had with the, the Falcons where I loved the spot. I'm like, if Ritter doesn't mess this up, you know, this is one of my top plays of the season. And sure enough, he was terrible. Uh, and and I understand the thinking that off Arthur Blank uh, does not want a situation where they have no quarterback. Uh, and so what happens if Kirk Cousins is slow to mend off of this injury because he's coming back? Off a, a, a severe injury, as an older player, um, you know I, I, I've heard the uh, the argument that you're setting up a locker room controversy where Cousins doesn't have any equity built up in the city of Atlanta or in this locker room as a leader. Well, so what? I mean, like the, the way that the NFL works, it's week to week as is. 
Cousins, if he's healthy, is going to do what Kirk Cousins is going to do. He's going to throw uh, some interceptions in key moments. He's going to go out there and lead you on a two-minute drill to win a game once or twice this season. He's a competent quarterback. He's proven that. He's a leader. He's an accurate passer. Uh, but if he is hurt, do you want to go to somebody else on that roster? Or do you want to give a very talented Michael Penix Jr. an opportunity uh, if he's able to learn from Cousins and go through all of these progressions you know, coming into that building uh, over the summer and then into the fall and, and uh, taking the normal amount of reps as a rookie and, and then potentially being ready if there's an injury to Cousins midseason so you're not messing around uh, with, with somebody that's very uh, less talented than he is uh, and in a position where he can be a life preserver for you. So, again, if they liked him as much as they said he did, uh, that they did, they were – People in that in that building that have worked with Matthew Stafford said, "Hey, this this guy's Matthew Stafford part two in terms of how he throws the ball." Then I, I can I can get behind that choice. I don't hate it as much as a lot of people did. Although obviously they had holes to fill. Yeah, I I, I expected them to go defense. I think like everybody else did. But again, not going to say they're all morons down there. So um, well, you know, from I, that I, standpoint, definitely I, Michael Penix is one of my top three favorite quarterbacks. In, in this draft, so maybe that has something to do with it too. You know, you know, Mark. I was, I was going to say, I can understand the pick, but you also have to consider: Does Atlanta really think that they are a Super Bowl or even a playoff contender this year? Because if they think that, then why wouldn't they? Uh, you know, then why wouldn't they have used the pick to help them now, as opposed to a would Penix be available in the second round, where a lot of people expected him to be? B if indeed they don't believe that they're a contender this year or that they can be a contender this year, then well you've got the, you rely on Cousins for a year or two, and as you build around him, and they could have done that with some of the players in the first round, and then there's always an opportunity to draft uh, Cousins' successor, the longer term answer, either in next year's draft or with a free agent signing during, during next year's off season, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, spending the uh, your, your your number one pick on a need that's not on on a on a position, let's say, or on a player who's not expected to help you or be needed to help you, except in an emergency situation this year. Well, Tony, let me ask you this then uh, before I turn it over to Greg and get his uh, his take on the draft. Which team do you feel crushed the draft? Which team did the best job in the National Football League draft this year? I mean, it, it was it was great for Arizona that they get the guy they want at four without any sweat. So I really like Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, the, the first shows where I, I joined you guys, uh, yeah, I was of the opinion that they were going to get the Bears were going to give up on on Justin Fields. Um, yeah, I, I really didn't have that uh, concrete a take as to whether that was the right decision or not. It just was writing on the wall they're going to take Caleb Williams and that's what they ended up doing. So the fact that they do take Caleb Williams and end up with Roma Dunze uh, to, to be a, a, the number three receiver there this season, uh, you know, really worked out wonderfully for them because you've got a number one and then you bring in a Keenan Allen. So now you've got a really low pressure situation for Dunze. Uh, you've got Cole Komet as a tight end. So you, you've got an arsenal of weapons now. Um, and, and again, the, the expectations are going to be there for Caleb Williams right out of the gate. And I think uh, we'll see if he's ready for them. But certainly, uh, I don't think the draft could have gone better uh, from for, from a on paper standpoint for Chicago. And now we'll see if it translates to the field. I'm going to turn this over to Greg De Palma, our producer here. Greg, and uh, again, kudos to the group at Our Lads and the, all that you contributed to that uh, terrific, terrific NFL draft guide. And uh, uh, before I ask you your opinion on what you saw of the draft, I got to I got to ask you one more probing question, if I may. And I don't like I say it's this Michael Penick situation. If he ends up being uh, everything and more that Fontenot thought he was going to be, kudos to him, and uh, he, he made a super super move. If he ends up not being that, I also have to have to question maybe the second pick for Atlanta in the draft is a defensive lineman, Ruke Olahara, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, I looked in the Our Lads draft guide, and he wasn't very, very highly touted. In fact, I think he was maybe expected to be a third-round pick. So now you're left with the Atlanta Falcons with the, everything hanging on Michael Penick's shoulders here. And if he doesn't come through and the second-round pick doesn't come through, it could end up being a disaster for Atlanta. What's your overall take on that, uh, Greg? 
Uh, yeah, trying to pronounce this guy's name. Yeah, a row, row, row. Uh, from Clemson. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, I right. mean, look, he, a good, solid player, defensive tackle, but defensive tackles normally at that position. Uh, I know Arledge probably had him drafted between the second and fourth round, um, and we had talked about him on some previous shows. Solid player, difference maker? No, not the type of difference maker that a lot of people thought Dallas Turner was going to be, which is why everybody had Turner going to Atlanta. Um I, I thought they were smart to not take Dallas Turner where they did because I never looked at Dallas Turner as a dominating top 10 pick. I think Dallas Turner is going to have a fine career in the NFL. He could do a lot of things, but he's not a difference maker. So I understand why they didn't go that route. Um, look, I don't know how much longer uh, McKay is going to have. Uh, you know, He's not the one making the final decisions, I guess, but he's been around the league for a long time. Uh, the GM there... Uh, he held on to his job, even though they got rid of the head coach. Uh, I know there are a lot of fans that wonder whether or not he'll be gone after this season if things don't turn out well. But, uh, yeah, this was strange just because of the fact that and, um, Andy brought up the thing about, well, the Green Bay model. I think the biggest difference there was that, um, like, for instance, the last time Green Bay made one of these moves was Jordan Love. But Jordan Love yep. was drafted in the later end of the first round. He wasn't a top 10 draft pick. They didn't go with Aaron Rodgers. Go, 18, hey. I think, something like that. Yeah, Yeah. so so there was like from, so it was the back end of the first uh, round instead of in the top 10. Uh, that never would have worked out if you would have drafted Jordan Love with Aaron Rodgers on the, uh, 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 in uniform for at least two more years. So that's a big difference. Um, I'm surprised, though, because a lot, the one thing I'm surprised about, though, is I think there were a lot of people who just believe, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is right, uh, that they made this move and didn't consult the owner. Uh, I mean, look, you don't want your owner getting involved in things like this, but uh, if I'm the owner, I, I probably would have liked to have been uh, in on this one because of the fact it's a quarterback, you got to pay the guy, he's not going to play for a couple of years. So that means you're going to have maybe two years before you have to make a decision on a fifth year option, that kind of deal. It's hard enough to make a decision on these guys with three or four years of, of taking a look at them, let alone just two years. But yeah, uh, it was everybody's wow moment. Um, we'll only find out whether or not it works out though in the long run. And that's what the that's why the draft, uh, you know, it's one of those deals that you can come back a year or two later and go, yeah, that really was a pretty smart pick after all. So that's you, that's who, if the general or, manager and director of player personnel are still there for yeah, the Falcons. If, to, to reap those benefits, yes. Yeah, so they better be right. I saw one of the, the best tweets I saw was uh, Fontenot talking with Arthur Blank and Arthur Blank conversing with him, and they, they said more or less in captions that he was explaining to Fontenot that next year his mission, he'll be a ticket taker at the Falcons <laughs> yeah. football games. <laughs> yeah, for the for the move that he made, I can't believe he wouldn't have discussed that with them in advance. But and anyway, by the way, I'm, a lot. Of, I, I was uh, Kevin Knight does a really good job covering Falcons for the hop for the Falcoholic. I'm sure I'll talk to him in the next few weeks and get his opinion firsthand. But I was watching their draft show, their live draft show, and they were not happy. I would not think not so. Happy. So well, and you take a look at that division. I, I, any of the four teams are capable of winning it this year based upon the overall rosters. So, you know, Atlanta, maybe that is, maybe their thinking is that, hey, it's a wide open division. We have Penix Jr. We don't really need him right now, but given Cousins' history of, of injuries, uh, we think that by the time, if there's such a time that he needs to come in, maybe they can do it because it is a wide open division uh, considering what the talent is on the other teams and Tampa Bay seemingly a little bit down from the last few years. Let me I know that the visual on on the Arthur Blank thing at, at, at the at the draft when Penix was drafted wasn't great, but I I, I do not believe that there's that he wasn't notified beforehand. Uh, and, and Dimitrov, I think, went on one of these shows and said there was no way he didn't know. So I I don't buy that part of it. I, he had to have known that that was going to be the pick. Whether he was 100 percent on board on it, that uh, I mean we'll, we'll we'll see if we hear about that. But there's no way that he flat out said no when they went uh, in that direction anyway, or didn't know what's or, the or, or didn't know. Right. I don't buy that. Or, or didn't know. That's your point. So, Greg, who do you think did uh, yeah. a smash job in the draft uh, of all the teams? Who do you give kudos to your highest mark? Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Les Need uh, with um, uh, the Rams. And uh, I think that he did a really good job again when you take a look at the fact that Jared Verse, a lot of people thought he was going to go in the top 10. 
and he ends up going later in the first round. I my, my favorite player in the entire draft, I said this in December, and now people started catching on because he had a phenomenal combine, was Braden Fisk, the guy they the, the defensive tackle they picked up in the second round. Love the kid. Um, he's not Aaron Donald, but he is just going to be a, a really big disruptor for him. They 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 have a, a diminutive running back already in the backfield, and then they go out and they get another diminutive guy. So I thought that made sense. You get Blake Corum in the third round, I believe it was. They pick up Kitchens, who our lads rated as the second best safety in the draft. I believe they got him in the third or the fourth round. And they also got a really good defensive tackle who had a lot of production alongside of a row, 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 Tyler Davis in the sixth round. So uh, if I had a if I had to put like high marks on somebody, um, I, I just think he is one of the most uh, underrated. Uh, matter of fact, I even I, I did a a show. Um, when was it? I think about a, a couple of weeks ago, and my thumbnail was. You know, basically, is he the most underrated general manager in the game? And I believe he is because he's never won executive of the year. Brandon Bean has two executive of the year award winner. He's a two-time executive of the year award winner. And Les Snead's never won one. And I think he's done a fantastic job. And I think he had a fantastic draft. Well, I think they've done real well for themselves, especially just considering when they won the Super Bowl and they had to let the whole ship fall apart. Yep. You know, they couldn't afford to sign anybody. They had let lose players and uh, – uh, lose draft picks on top of it. it. It looked like a real dismal situation for the Rams, and you blink, and all of a sudden they're back in it. A nice season last year and a rock solid draft, as you mentioned this year. So. And last year, they picked up yeah, some really good players in the draft. Yeah. Yep, back to back years, and it's going to make them formidable. I think this football. By the way, season. by the way, Mark, I'd like to hear what everyone thinks about. I happen to like what they did, the Chargers and Jim Harbaugh. You know, um, when we were doing our mock drafts. And I, I, and I was conducting uh, uh, one of the shows, and I did not have the Chargers pick on another show. And then my retort was because they were going after wide receiver. And my retort was, look, I know Jim Harbaugh. He's not, he, doesn't, he doesn't care about wide receivers early in the draft. I mean, as long as, I've been, as long as he's been at Michigan, he could care less about wide receivers. Sure, does he want to have skill positions like anybody else? Yes, but if he was going to pick it, he picked tight end over wide receiver, and he was not going to draft um, Bowers at number five. So, of course, he was going to go offensive line. And then, because it was such a deep receiver class, you take the receiver second, which is what he did by to go with McConkey in the second round. He also, because they have the former Michigan defensive coordinator, he picks up Junior Colson, the linebacker from Michigan. So that's perfect because he's the, you know, he's the intermediary from the coach. So he's going to be able to understand the defense and be a lot easier to be the, the field general um, in year one. He picked up a really good defensive back in Cam Hart. He picked up another receiver, Jerry Rice's kid, late in the draft. And they also picked up a running back from Troy, uh, Kamal Vidal, who I think could be a really good sleeper pick in this draft. Not saying he's a superstar, he's too small. Yeah, but he's a productive, tough kid. And uh, and then to boot, he did pick another Michigan guy, Cornelius Johnson, who I'm sure is going to help on special teams. Uh, and then also maybe help with the offensive translation. So, yeah, I thought they did a really good job, and Alt is going to have a great career. I, I think they they don't have enough yet to catch Kansas City, but I think they've closed the gap significantly. I agree, Andy. I think I got to give an A for the draft. Tamiki Monty Vidal was, was, was what was yeah, that? Definitely, to, to me, Kamani Vidal was the most productive. To me, Kamani Vidal was the, the most productive running back in all of college football last year. Uh, and I know Forum had more touchdowns, and there was other guys, but I also saw that in pass pro, Vidal like stood out in terms of metrics over everybody else, even even if he is smaller. Like his technique was brilliant. So I, I think that to get him, I, I think it was a sixth rounder, right, Greg? Yeah, it was late. Uh, yep. Fifth or sixth. He, he was one of the steals of the draft. I thought the Eagles did well with Nye Smith. So, yeah, I mean, like there, there were some guys where I, I, I tuned out to tune into the NBA playoffs and then went back and looked at some of the names. It, it stunned me that Vidal lasted so long. Maybe he was a size concern. But from a from an on field stand a skill standpoint, and you know some guys just out, outplay their their frames in the NFL, and the Chargers have ironically had a few of those that come to mind. Uh, I think he's going to be a, a load uh, in this league and stick around for a long time. Really does excited. Any, does anybody they, know how many Michigan players uh, or how many players from Michigan that Harbaugh actually drafted? 
I believe it was two, but I, or three. I was it three? Yeah, um, I know, I know two of them. Um, but also, I think the other question, though, Mark, is is how many guys did he sign after the draft? Because uh, yeah. come on, from the, from the secret draft, right? Yeah, I mean, in that because you know all of those kids are going to give him first shot. So I haven't looked at it yet, but I would be very intrigued to find out if he signed any and overall who those players were. I got to believe at least a few of them. There's a story that uh, we picked up and we reported yeah, on. I, I got it if you want to know just real quick. Yes. Dra drafted Colson and Johnson, like you mentioned, and the the only undrafted free agent from Michigan is uh, their uh, guard, Carson Barnhart. But uh, everybody else is from other schools. So. But he, he technically wouldn't count as a draft pick, but uh, at least he was selected. And I was uh, the fact that I was alluding to is uh, I came across an article about how important what they call these secret draft players are and uh, how well they've worked out. In fact, they worked out even better than six and seven seeds combined, these players that they pick up in this uh, non-drafted status. So uh, that's very, very important. But my whole point here is that uh, the team that led all teams in the National Football League draft this year was not Alabama, uh, was not Georgia, it was Michigan with 13 players off that roster here. That's probably serves the point, the fact that they are the defending national champion. And they were a deeply, deeply talented football team. Yeah, I remember just a few years ago in one of these drafts, and it was like they had like one player drafted. And it was just embarrassing yep. to be a Michigan yes, fan at that point. And like you said, that's, that's how you know uh, that a coach has changed the culture there when you have 13 players. And by the way, the fact that 13 players were drafted probably had a lot to do with the fact that he wasn't able to sign any of the guys because they were all drafted. Uh, on, on the opposite end of that ladder, guys, uh, you, you see all these power uh, power five conference teams dominate, you know, the players that are being drafted in the, within the draft. And, uh, you know, Texas had 11, Alabama had 10, Washington had 10. But Ohio State only had four players drafted this year, and I think uh, that speaks for maybe what might be going on at Ohio State. And uh, you know, I don't know if it's a Ryan Day type thing, but uh, the move to, to hire Chip Kelly, I think, might have been a move out of desperation that he knows he's got to do something there. And it was affirmed by the fact that only four Buckeyes were taken in the draft, and they draft as well, or they recruit, I should say, as well as any team does in the country. So if you go from real high recruiting uh, rankings to only having four players selected that means something happened between the time they entered columbus and the time they left columbus so you know there could be something in the in, uh, in the making there at ohio state i wonder how much the uh, transfer portal may have to do with that i'm sure as it has a lot to do with it as far as players leaving before they complete you know their their college eligibility at ohio state we'll probably be seeing that with a lot of uh of, of the major power teams uh, throughout college football, especially with the even more liberalized uh, transfer rules that uh, I think they agreed to a few months ago. Yeah, I, I, I made a, a point on because, uh, again, I do those Rutgers shows on the Rutgers channel, uh, the postgame shows, and I was talking to them about, I forget what it was, it had something to do with, um, it was, must have been right after the draft last year, and uh, I brought up the fact that there were some really top-rated recruits that went to Maryland, you know, and they're battling for Rutgers uh, for, for, for these recruits. And I remember saying on the show, if this isn't a perfect opportunity for, say, Coach Yano at Rutgers to, to when he's sitting in with new recruits to go, you see what happens when you go to Maryland? You don't get drafted. You don't, you, you're not a better player than when you got there. You come here, take a look at my record. Take a look at the guys that weren't even drafted. Take a look at the defensive back that was drafted last year for Tampa Bay, and he's a starter now this year. Christian Izian. I develop my guys. They don't. Well, as was touched on about that, Andy mentioned about the transfer portal affecting uh, the status of the teams and the players that were drafted. Uh, I want to remind our listeners and viewers out there, you want to be sure to pick up a copy of the 2024 Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine if for no other reason Tony Mejia is going to hit on the transfer portal and explain a lot of the nuances and what went on and what to watch for this season. So look for Tony's article inside the guide this year. That'll be a real, real good read, I promise you. Guys, before we turn it over oh, to you. By the way, excuse uh, me, Mark, uh, ahead, uh, when, will, yes. when will that be available? Probably around, what, July 4th or thereabouts? Well, it's going to be on sale at newsstands uh, July 16th. July 16th. We're going a week later here on advice of our distributor, and primarily the advice being that Sometimes you can go out too early, and what happens is the Barnes and Noble stores and that they pull books uh, 
by date and they could pull it before people even realize it was even there. So we're listening and we're doing what they say, but July 16th on sale, new stands across the country, Barnes and Noble and our friends at Vegas at the Gamers Book Club will have them as and well. That, and that means that you'll probably have the latest information of these preseason publications, which come out. I've seen them come out as early as Memorial Day weekend, some of the major ones. So there's a lot that goes on between Memorial Day and, well, let's say July 4th, the uh, publication day. So it's it's an app. I mean, look, Mark, I've been using it, I think, ever since the first one came out. What was it, like 1991 or something like that? Yeah, this will be so, the 32nd year, right? Exactly. Yeah, so it, it's been just a tremendous uh, uh, resource to use. Uh, I'm one of the old-fashioned type people. I still like to hold things in my hand and go back and flip through the pages rather than have to scroll up and down and miss it by 15 pages or something. Make it. In fact, I I get at least two of them every year, sometimes three, because I mark up with the notes and everything, underline things with the highlighters, because it really has just about everything you could ask for as far as when it comes to uh, wagering on uh, on college and pro football, because it is a com combined uh, publication. So I, I highly recommend it, and I can't wait. It's almost like a holiday for me when it comes out. Well, thanks to the unsolicited uh, uh, confirmation on that, Andy, if you will. I really appreciate that. And I'm kind of pulling my hair out right now because one of the other reasons we're going out later with it is, is to go out as late as we possibly can because – information on college football players coming back from the portal, which Tony's going to be working on, to returning starters, to returning production. You mix and you blend all that stuff together here. The fact of the matter is these colleges are no longer providing a lot of that information uh, readily. Uh, a lot of colleges don't even have SIDs to report on what's going on with these programs here. So it's sort of a little bit of a fight putting all this together here. So, But when it does come out, it's going to, I guarantee it, will be, will be worth the read doing just that. Guys, before we go over to the NFL side of things in the college football, one quick question I want to ask everybody here about uh, from this draft, uh, and, and I'll give you the uh, past these figures along that. When you're looking at rookie of the year and you're talking about props, you're looking ahead to possible props and you're looking at rookie of the year from the players that are coming out of this draft. Uh, since 2010, every offensive rookie of the year has there have been seven quarterbacks, four running backs, and three wide receivers. On the defensive side, there have been eight defensive linemen, three linebackers, and three defensive backs. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to start with you, Greg. Out of this group here, this core, who do you make or see as being your NFL Rookie of the Year coming out of this draft? Oh, uh, I'm going to give it to the guy that uh, I, I think is and, and should have been picked up first overall, and it's Jaden Daniels. So I, uh, I, I think that uh, he's going to have and, and, and he's going to be the one that is going to um, be able to come right out of the gates and be successful, sort of like C.J. Stroud. Um, Caleb, I, I think he's going to do pretty well, too, but um, there's going to be so much pressure on him. I think that's going to hurt him a little bit. Um, and also, Washington has built some good structure with their coaching staff. they got some good veteran guys there, and I think that'll be a calming influence for Daniels. So, yeah, so I would say Daniels, I'm sure he's going to be one of the short prices if you're looking for NFL Rookies of the Year. So you can't make much money if you pick him. Um, so I'll have to take a look and see if I can find any uh, good sleepers. Well, he would be he would be a, my choice anyway. I, I was kind of interested and stunned to learn that he has the college football all-time highest efficiency passer rating in college football. Uh, and that was either from last year or the year before, but uh, I'm with you. I'm a, I'm a Jaden Daniels guy. Tony, who do you see? Rookie of the Year coming out of this draft. Well, Sporting News had me write a, a column on the odds right the day after the draft, so that's up. Uh, if you go to my author page uh, over there, um, and it's available on my on my Twitter uh, in the bio, so all you have to do is click on that and he had narrow. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just broke down the odds and and you know how these fit players fit. Caleb Williams is plus two hundred after the draft, so you basically get two to one or getting one to two, doubling your investment. Uh, Jaden Daniels, who I, I could absolutely get behind, but I, I, I prefer Williams over Daniels in the situation that they're walking into, even though Daniels does get Cliff Kingsbury to collaborate with. Daniels is plus 650. Jaylen, uh, J.J. McCarthy, who also has a ton of weapons, obviously, in uh, Jefferson and Addison and, and uh, you know, T.J. Hawkinson and all of that, uh, plus 800. Uh, and then receiver-wise, you got Marvin Harrison Jr. He should be there number one immediately. He's plus 600. Malik Neighbors, number one at New York, plus 900. Um, and then you, you go on down the line. Obviously, the biggest sleeper to me is going to be Xavier Worthy, plus 1600. I think that Rashi Rice is going to be fine in terms of his legal uh, handlings uh, to be the Chiefs' number one wide receiver this, this season. 
But uh, it, will there be a sophomore slump? Will anything happen in terms of uh, what we saw in the Super Bowl where Rice was clearly frustrated with Mahomes? Obviously, Kelsey's still going to be the top dog as far as, uh, you know, going over the middle and being the number one target. But, you know, does Xavier Worthy take some of Rasheed Rice's touches away and emerge as a guy that is the Tyreek Hill in that offense because he has the speed to do it? Um, plus 1,600. Uh, I can't go wrong with that. Nix is plus 1,600. Adunze is plus 1,800. Brock Bowers is plus 2,500. So those are the, the, the top – those are the top offensive number uh, guys. Obviously, no running backs were taken in the in that first round. But to me, uh, I, I thought that uh, Arizona, uh, the, the Miami Dolphins, got the top running back available in Jalen Wright. Uh, but he just goes into a, a, a very crowded situation with uh, a chain and uh, and the other running back that they have over there, Mostert. Well, I thought uh, I, I, the worthy pick. Uh, I got to ask you this, Andy. Uh, he, he looks like he fits like a glove uh, in Kansas City here. You know, they're going to start talking uh, uh, a, a little bit of Tyreek Hill about him with speed and uh, uh, Mahomes being his quarterback, so forth, and being a target. Are you buying all that at Kansas City? And uh, if you are, is he your choice for rookie of the year? Or if he isn't, who is? Uh, Tony, what did what did you say the odds were on Worthy? I've got, him, I've got him posted. Yeah, you can see him there, Andy. Okay. I was going to say he might be the value pick. Because the, the other three that I were considering were Caleb Williams, uh, Jalen Daniels, and uh, Marvin Harrison. I'll dispense with Marvin Harrison simply because uh, there's not much around him. He figures to be the featured guy, and so he may not get the numbers that the other uh, that the two quarterbacks might get, even as, uh, looking at some of the receivers. Worthy might be even uh, similar, if not better, than, uh, than, than Harrison, simply because he's going to get a lot, of op- a lot of opportunities with some of the other uh, players being double teamed on, on Kansas City. Uh, the, now, Caleb, as much as I talked about earlier and for the last several months about what Chicago did, I think Caleb Williams has a lot of talent around him to be able to put up some very good numbers, especially, you know, with uh, uh, Keenan Allen coming over, DJ Moore, and uh, you know, with the, like I said, some young running backs who were who were effective last year. Daniels, the, the concern I have with Daniels again is that is the uh, team that he's playing on may not have the, enough of the supporting cast right now for him to put up those kind of numbers. But if you ask me, uh, who may end up having the more productive career? And again, we don't know about injuries, and, and that's a concern with Daniels. He might end up having a more productive career overall than uh, Williams if we look back at this, say, three, four years down the road. Already, uh, good overview, good run there from the college football draft for the National Football League draft of the college football players. And I want to remind our listeners out there that if you like what we're doing, uh, click on the like button down below, please. And also, if you haven't subscribed, we really encourage you to subscribe to the site. We're going to be back, like I say, in July, getting ready for the football season. But sure nice to have you aboard. And we'll be putting out some spot videos and some spot podcasts between now and then. And you'll be informed of them when we do. So subscribe and you'll also be attuned to just that fact. Hit that subscribe button, if you will. Guys, let's go over to uh, a little bit of a sneak preview. I know it's we can't get too in-depth right now, uh, but we can look at least, and I know there will be some talk about that, looking at the 2024 college and NFL football seasons here. And let's keep it on the college football side of things and look at college football uh, for the 2024 football season. And uh, I'll just lay the table, if I will, for the uh, lay it out in the, or for the artwork here, the groundwork here, that uh, college football – to me, was obviously the demise of the Pac-12 last year, or what we're going to see this year for the demise of the Pac-12 last year. It was absolutely, just absolutely heartbreaking to see what happened the way it rolled out. Now we're going to find teams that are going to have to pay the price for doing just that, and some of those teams, mainly two of those teams, are going to be teams out of the Pac-12 that are going to be playing in the ACC conference this year, and what a joke that is. I mean, California and Stanford and the ACC – Well, what we did is we broke down the air travel miles that they're going to have to endure in doing stuff like that. And it's not pretty, guys. Uh, California's air miles to the seven ACC teams that were in the ACC last year and going to those away games, they're going to be traveling anywhere from 2,400 to 3,100 miles per trip. That means 19,270 miles round trip for them. Stanford, the same way. They've got 2,300 to 3,000 miles from low to high, and they're going to be totaling 19,022 miles. I think it's just uh, it's outrageous what they're doing to these teams and making them play like that. We're going to have similar situations in the Pac-10 as well. 
you got the you know the Washingtons going to the Pac-10 or I mean to the Big Ten like that, going to Rutgers and situations like that. Uh, that's one thing at the top of the surface that's going to come into play this year. Uh, the other thing I would consider looking at during the offseason, and you'll be able to ferret this out in the Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine, is how important returning experience is in college football. When I talk about returning experience, I'm talking about either returning starters or I'm talking about production that's returning. Teams that actually contributed to the team last year aren't going to be there again to contribute once again this year. If you take a look at the rankings here, this is pretty interesting. Uh, the number one team in returning experience in college football this year is going to be Virginia Tech, uh, bringing 22 starters back, uh, 11 on offense, uh, with obviously their starting quarterback here. And they rank number one in the Bill Conley overall returning production rankings. Uh, this is a football team here that uh, that's the same honor that went to Kansas last year. I'm calling it out because Kansas was the number one returning team last year, and you saw what they did last year. They improved three full games last year with the benefit of all that experience, and watch out for Virginia Tech. They're going to likely be in that similar boat this year. Also, number two on that list as far as returning production goes is Iowa State out of the Big 12. Uh, they improved from four wins to seven last year. Uh, the biggest concern for me, though, when I look inside the numbers is the fact that while they went from four wins to seven, their offense and defense regressed last year. I don't know how that happened, but it did. But nonetheless, they're going to be number two in overall experience. The worst team in college football coming back from an overall experience standpoint is the Air Force. And the fact is the military academies never bring much back in returning production as it is anyway. Uh, and it's a team here that's won 29 games the last three years. Uh, they could be going backward this football season. And the second worst team, Ohio University, out of the MAC conference here. Uh, it's going to get mighty, mighty lean for this team. They won 10 games in back to back years, and they won't smell, smell half of that this particular football season. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Greg, and uh, your little quick take and observation on what you're foreseeing for the college football season coming up this year. I, I know. I, I got to, I'm going <laughs> to. Uh, let me just say this. I mean, you know how hard it is. We all know how hard it is. Maybe they don't, uh, what it takes for you to put these preview magazines together, especially uh, for college football, because sure. you have to dive into, this is a few years ago even, you know, spring and, and, and where do these guys fit and all that. With the transfer portal, I, I don't know how you do it. I just don't. Um, because really all you're getting and all you have is just you know the players that are there, but that's pretty much it. I mean, um, I watched the Rutgers spring game the other day. They had no starters playing, none. And I can imagine a lot of these pro schools probably doing the same thing. So it's so hard to figure out other than just knowing, you know, all right, I know this guy's going to be there. I know Dylan Gabriel is going to be the quarterback of Oregon and so forth. It's just so hard to figure out. That's why I, th I think your point is, is extremely important as far as returning production because that's a very important stat that at least you know. You, you, it's something you actually physically know. So, yeah, I think it's going to be really tough to figure out. Um, I would probably have to take a look knowing Texas. I'm not a Sarkeesian fan. I know you aren't either. But to know he gets his quarterback back, they've got playoff experience. I think that's important. You know Oregon's going to be competitive. They're going to have Dylan Gabriel. And I'm and anybody can take Georgia, Ohio State. But that, that next those next two teams on the list, I think those would be the teams that I would look at, especially Texas. They're going to be pretty tough with viewers coming back with the playoff experience. Andy, I'm going to ask you the same question. I know we're a little early on in the game right now. Uh, we don't have a lot to work with, a lot to absorb as far as information goes. But uh, what is your feeling as you're looking forward to the 2024 college football season with all of the conference realignments, all of the transfer portals, even more than they've ever been before? And like I said, Tony is going to be uh, reporting on that in the Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. What's your take, Andy, on the college football 2024 season? What are we looking at? Well, once again, and you guys have sort of alluded to it, the transfer portal has meant that there's more turnover from season to season uh, than we've ever seen before. There have always been transfers, but then you had to sit out a year, and and so that was not the you know that was not a major overhaul. You had players who had uh, gone out of their eligibility, graduated, or had and gone into the NFL draft, or those who had declared a little early to be able to go into the draft. So that has been probably, I'm going to say, threefold, if not more, the number of departures or changes in, in roster composition. So it's very difficult until you get really close to 
the start of the season. You see how teams are doing or coming out of their uh, their summer camps, which is why it's very difficult for me, at least, to make a wager on a futures team at this time of the year. I think the people who have the edge in making future bets right now are those handicappers and bettors who concentrate on just a handful of teams or a handful of conferences. And so they know all the teams, let's say, in the Big 12. They know nothing about, let's see, the ACC because they don't focus on that, at least until the season gets underway. Those are the people, I think, who have the advantages because, remember, you're tying up your money on futures for basically eight or nine months at a minimum, and there could be so much that will occur between the time you make the wager and the time that the season even begins in late August or early September. So if I'm going to look at teams that I would expect to be in contention, and they're probably at short odds. Georgia comes into mind first because they have, in the last four or five years, become uh, at a level of what Alabama and Clemson were throughout the 20-teens and into the early 2020s. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen with Alabama uh, with the coaching change retirement of Nick Saban. Another team that I like because they've always been consistent, even though the coaches come under criticism, Penn State has always been a consistent player in the upper echelon of uh, the uh, uh, of the Big Ten. Really, uh, after the, uh, the Joe Paterno left, I think, about a decade or so ago, and uh, uh, we've had uh, a couple of coaches take over. I think Bill O'Brien was there for a bit, and now, of course, uh, you've got the current coach there who's uh, been around for years and continually gets criticized, but he continues to have you know, 9, 10, 11 win seasons and is always a factor. And you, know, you have to wonder if Michigan is ripe for a decline this year without Harbaugh and all the people who left the uh, program as a result of being the national championship and uh, the, uh, uh, the number of players who left. As I say, Ohio State, you did uh, express some concerns about the fact that only four were drafted, so that does bring up some current. So those are the two that come immediately to mind without doing any uh, deep research. I guess I'd have to throw Texas uh, in there as well, except for the fact that I'm not quite sure if they are up to the full uh, uh, recruiting level that it'll take a couple of years now that they're going to be in the SEC and might have to uh, go up against much tougher defenses on a weekly basis than they've seen in the Big 12. Well, Tony, let me uh, roll this right back to you then. Uh, uh, mention Georgia, mention recruiting, and Georgia is where they are because they are the recruiting champs. They've out-recruited everybody the last five years. Alabama inclusive, and that's the reason Georgia has been the national champion and is winning the Southeast Conference. I think that's a great starting point, at least to begin. We don't know how many of those recruits they're losing. Uh, obviously, you know that's going to be kind of our, our duty or our job to keep a pulse on that. But uh, when you're looking at prospects for the twenty for the next football season here, how much do you take recruiting rankings into effect? You look at it. I mean, you obviously know that all that most of these most of these schools the, the teams at the top are the teams that can afford to lose one or two players at, at at key positions and keep it moving without being crippled i mean look what one of my uh, one of my handicapping tactics is looking and this is in both college sports college football and college basketball i like to read what coaches say in the blue ribbon and college hoops uh preseason as to whose growth that they're anticipating or who's key guys, key glue guys that they can't anticipate being without, or, um, you know, what, what the progression has been over the course of the years. And they do a, a fine job with that publication. And then you lose those guys for the year. So what happens? And then what, what, what has happened within the two or three games after that, who stepped up that kind of thing. I think that using that as a projection really helps me out. And in, in college football, same thing. So you look at your publication, you look at all the others that are available um, that I use as resources. I use yours, you do a fine job. I'm, I'm ecstatic to be contributing to this year's. Uh, you know, the fact is we're projecting. So you got our depth charts. Our depth charts don't come out of thin air. They come out of the two deeps and the spring games and the whatnot. So immediately, and this is why I don't do anything uh, futures wise or, uh, at all with college football. Um, you look at what happens during spring football. I had the benefit as a student reporter at UCF to watch a program essentially grow. And I was granted access that I'm sure a lot of media was not back in my reporter days because I used to fly on the team plane to, to places like Auburn and Georgia uh, when, these, when UCF was a guarantee school, playing guarantee games and getting their brains kicked in. And Dante Culpepper grew out of that. So I got to go to two-a-days. And I got to go into the locker room and see these guys and 
that is an amazingly grueling process, especially in the South and in Orlando, where the humidity is in the, it makes it feel like you're at 110, 120 degrees. And my point in this is that attrition sets in very early in college football. Your August and all of uh, late July and into August and ultimately into September. And it is who survives that to com to make your coaches too deep intact what they envisioned, what they put on their whiteboards uh, in, in uh, May and June in September and October. And the team that, that really comes out of games and whatnot, I think, it, it, it is who has the, the supreme advantage in college football. And now the transfer portal uh, makes that even murkier. So from from the standpoint of who I project, yeah, Georgia to me is by far the favorite and should be. Ohio State, I like Will Howard a lot. Is he going to be that guy, the guys are going to be Devin Brown, who they've been hyping for years uh, as, as C.J. Stroud's uh, you know, his, uh, his projected guy last year before he got hurt, his replacement. And now, now he's got to fight off Paul Howard. They've got a brand new offensive line. We've got to replace Marvin Harrison Jr. So I, I don't buy them at all as the, as the number two choice as DraftKings has them. Texas, obviously, they've got some continuity in play and lost some key guys. Oregon lost some key offensive linemen, some key defenders. Uh, and and I, I obviously am partial to Dylan Gabriel because he was UCF's quarterback there for a while. Love his accuracy. Think he'll do great and is, is a wonderful college quarterback. But again, they, there's there's so many pieces around him, and they lost so many uh, key skill players. You've got LSU replacing a, a, a Heisman Trophy winner. You've got Alabama with a coaching change. Uh, you've got Michigan coaching change. There's some continuity there. But we've talked about how they lost an amazing amount of talent to the draft. Florida State, um, you know. A lot of those guys that felt slighted and should have chips on their shoulder going into this season are in the NFL now. So uh, it's it's going to be a clean slate, uh, I, not to mention what we talked about with the, the Pac-12 dispersing into other conferences and how that is going to affect uh, the Big 12 and the ACC. Uh, so and, and the Big 10, obviously, with the, the two biggies, the California schools don't move in in there. So it's an amazingly new landscape. Uh, if, if you put a gun to my head, I'm going to go chalk with Georgia, but uh, let's just uh, let's just unfold those onion, the layers of the onion as they uh, as they transpire week to week. Well, if Georgia plays with that chip on their shoulder this year after having not been invited to the college football playoff last year, like they displayed in their bowl game, <laughs> they indeed could be somebody nobody will want to play this year. I think There's some uh, really good, uh, before we wrap up in, in a sure. little bit, um, some guys to keep an eye on. That, again, if you want to look for long shots, um, I really like the quarterback transfer, the kid Quinn from Toledo to Baylor. Uh, that was their real big weakness last year was Baylor at quarterback. And this kid, Finn, was an electrifying player in the MAC. We know how good Toledo has been the last couple of years, so I think that's going to be significant. I'm just a big Grayson McCall fan. I think he's got big pro potential. He gets an opportunity now to play in the ACC with NC State. Dave Dorn's done a really good job there. Now he's got a difference maker at a quarterback. Um Miami. Is that like a sixth year? Is this sixth or seventh year for Grayson McCall, Greg? He's yeah, been I don't know around about a seven, time. but six might be yeah. about right. Uh, <laughs> Miami, look, I, I I still believe that Ordron is going to do. I, I mean, um, uh, Miami's coach Marco Cristobal. Cristobal, Cristobal. that yeah. he's going to do a really good job because he's just a tremendous recruiter. And because of that, I think that now he's able to get Cam Ward, one of the more uh, exciting quarterbacks that nobody really has heard of outside the big schools because he didn't go to Washington. He went to Washington State. They get Martinez, the running back from Oregon State. You know he's going to recruit well, so I think they could be interesting. Riley Leonard going to Notre Dame. If he could just stay healthy, that is a big addition to the program. I think they're about 25 to 1. And then the one player um, that uh, I think might be a sleeper, even though he shouldn't be um, because he's not a quarterback going to Ohio State, is Judkins. I know you're a big fan of Judkins, Mark, and oh, now yeah. he gets I, to play at Ohio State. Yeah, I played him on a future to win uh, to win rushing yards last year, and uh, he still has that potential. I think it's a big, big pickup by the Buckeyes. Uh, just one, one yeah. quick thing, just just to, just to highlight what this transfer portal looks like. I'm obviously I'm 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 impartial in almost every sport, and I'm impartial in college football too because the team I'm with is uh, is whoever I have money on. But obviously, I am a UCF fan, 
So I'm looking at this and it, the transfer portal becomes like Christmas in, in, in May right now. I got your Curry Brown coming in from Miami because he, he needed to transfer out because he didn't win that spot there, but he was a five star. Uh, Penny Boone running back at Toledo Almack, he's coming to UCF. Jacoby Jones, a wide receiver, uh, one year of eligibility left, he's coming. And you have these situations across the country where guys that don't like what their outlook was exiting spring football suddenly say, you know what, I'm going this place. And that is going to be the shuffle over the next couple of months that's going to throw even a further wrench into things as we uh, prepare for the season. You know, Let I was me wrap this up. Mark, Go ahead, Mark, I was just going to mention something. Interesting conference this year will be the Big 12 with no Texas or Oklahoma. So you wonder who is going to rise to the top. Perhaps the most consistent program over the last decade and a half, almost 20 years, has been Oklahoma State with Gundy. Um, I think Kansas State and Kansas are also well positioned to perhaps move into the upper tier of teams over the next few years. Both are well coached, and I think that there's enough talent on those teams. So uh, you might find some value as far as a national championship odds with a team like in Oklahoma State, because it, whoever you happen to like in that conference, they don't have the Texas and the Oklahoma to wonder about this year. That's, that's a great point. Yeah. And no, by the no. way, they what's, what's they're going to have two guys that are going to be high draft picks when they come out. Ollie Gordon, the running back, and uh, Oliver, the defensive lineman. Those are two big-time talents that maybe you, you hit it right there, Andy. Take a look at Oklahoma State and think a good quarterback play. They've got one of the best running backs in the nation, and they've got a very good defensive lineman. So to, to wrap this up before we go over the NFL side of things, guys, uh, I think the point I want to make to our listeners and our viewers out there is we talked a lot about experience. We talked a lot about returning production. We talked about college football recruiting rankings. These are all the three main tools that I use almost exclusively throughout the first month of the college football season. Because what you do is you let all that come together, you wrap it all up, you let it come together. And then after September, you see what you've got, whether or not it did come to fruition or if it didn't, why not? So everything we're talking about here, use that as a guide to help you get out of the blocks strong in September. That's my message. And don't forget, playoffs. Yes. Oh, the college football playoffs. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll hit on that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, when we that makes it even more uh, susceptible to upsets and not so easy for the better teams because they just had to play one game and they're in the championship, you know? So exactly right. be a little bit exactly more difficult. Right. Yep, exactly which, by, right. which, by the way, brings up the expanded playoff format, meaning that you might find some very good future odds if you've got, and I don't have the schedule in front of me, two heavyweight teams meeting early in September like we often see. The loser of that team may still end up having a very good season, be able to work its way back with the expanded playoffs. They may all of a sudden go from, let's say, 15 or 18 to 1 to 25 or 30 to 1 because they lost an early season game and they've got to overcome a lot of teams to move back up. But with the additional spots available, that could be worth a play if you keep an eye in the, September. The jig is up for one of you guys. Sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, they're, they're coming after one of you guys. I don't know who. <laughs> and, and look, it's also going to be, uh, uh, as Andy said, because maybe you take advantage of it this year before any other year and everybody catches up. Because if you do lose, let's say, one of those games, most likely the odds get bloated. You don't have a chance. Now, the odds won't get bloated as much, but I just will be very interested to see when a team loses, like a team that you think has a shot, but they may not be Georgia or Ohio State, and they lose, how far do the odds drop now that there's more opportunity to get back into the playoffs? Yeah, Good one point. one such game is actually going to be here in Vegas over Labor Day weekend, and I don't know that you would consider either of them a, a, ten, a title contender, although LSU is highly ranked. They're going to play USC uh, to start the season. So one of those teams will start the season uh, with that loss, and they might drop considerably down. They're both going to be highly ranked, LSU especially, but should LSU, for example, lose, they still have an opportunity to make it back up even though it's going to be, a, even though they play in the what will be even tougher SEC this year. I, so you the would biggest think question that I have to that uh, to that point, Andy, is uh, I like to pair conferences in my database and see how conferences fare against other conferences. We're going to have the SEC playing <laughs> the Big Ten. Okay, yeah. so is it really a Big Ten team that I'm looking at right. and factoring in? What or if it's it like Texas California? against USC and you say, well, it's a big, te it's an SEC team versus a Big Ten team. Wait a second. I thought they were Big 12 versus Pac-12. I'll, I'll tell you the problem with that kind of analysis overall. And again, it relates to the transfer portal that you have 
if you go conference by conference, the composition of a team, let's say when a guy comes in as a freshman to Texas, forget the fact that they're moving to the SEC, but the, the, he'll be on a team that is extremely different than, let's say, a decade or so by the time he's ready to graduate if he stays at Texas. So the composition of the teams within the conference, it was about a decade ago when we saw the last significant overhaul of conferences. I think, I don't remember, like 30, 35% of conference affiliations changed within about a four-year period, and we're seeing something like that now. So I understand, and I used to use it a lot, especially in college basketball, but it's a lot less meaningful now, I believe, unless you make some accommodations for the fact that, hey, you only want to include, let's say, uh, big Big Tens, you want to eliminate teams that were in the Big Ten, say, in uh, uh, 2009 that have not been here since, let's say, the uh, 2014 season, depending on how far you go back. And you can have a three-loss team in the SEC make the playoffs this year. And I don't think anybody would be probably too upset about it because, again, the schedule is going to be murderous. Love talking right. college football. I know that. That's for sure. We could we could probably talk another hour. And <laughs> they just got finished with their spring game. So uh, <laughs> don't encourage us. Is it 2024 yeah, really, really. already? <laughs> okay, guys, let's get over to the National Football League side of things and let's take a quick preview look at uh, what perhaps we might be considering in this off season before we get to the 2024 season here. And I'm going to lay the groundwork once again here with a couple of opinions or thoughts, and I'll pass it off to everybody else here. Uh, my first thought is this, and it's probably something that everybody knows, but uh, I think it needs to be said that uh, it has to go down in National Football League history is the worst trade ever made, the Cleveland Browns for Deshaun Watson. Uh, look at the cost. Excuse me, excuse me, Mark. Is that worse than the Herschel Walker trade? Well, is from a, a financial sense. stand. <laughs> well, let me put you this way, Andy. From a Cleveland Browns fan standpoint, okay? <laughs> Definitely, yes. Yes. But I mean, uh, it, you know, because of the way things are turning out and things are happening, but that Herschel Walker trade, uh, you know, was a significant trade as well back in, uh, what, 88, 89, whenever it was. So here's what the Browns did. Uh, in 2022, they gave up a first and a fourth round pick. Last year, they gave up a first and a third round pick. This year, they gave up a first and a third round pick. And they signed this kid to an absolutely massive, fully guaranteed contract. And it's absolutely destroyed the morale of the football team here. Uh, and that's not to say what they did to the Houston Texans and put them on the map. They benefited from all these trades and all these draft picks. And you see what Houston's done the last two years. And they're going to continue to keep building because of the stupidity of a trade like that. Now, Watson may end up having a great career and he could end up taking the Browns, you know, deep into the playoffs. And so, but he's supposed to do that, you know, for the, when he's being paid, he's supposed to do that. I just wanted to say that it was, to me, it's the worst trade in the national football league history. Number two, no team in the national football league collapsed worse last year than the Jacksonville Jaguars. They were nine and eight at a point. We saw when Trevor Lawrence got hurt and they just completely, completely. Uh, How about Philadelphia? Well, I might say even how, how about Miami, okay, also, okay, yeah. down, down the stretch. Miami, remember Miami's 5-1 and one through week six. They were averaging 500 yards a game, and what did they do? They go 2-4 and four out. They averaged 339 yards a game, 1-5 and five straight up and against a spread against the uh, – or 1-6, and six, I should say, Stuats, against the fellow playoff teams they met last year. They were absolutely a name and reputation type team. The only reason I'm calling this out, guys, is uh, – uh, these are teams that, like Miami, uh, Jacksonville, Philadelphia, that have egg on their face coming into this football season here. And you might want to watch them closely in the offseason here because I think they're going to be doing things to improve or turn that situation around. And my last note of interest before I hand it off to the guys here is you're taking a look at the L.A. Chargers, and we talked about them on, on the NFL draft and the, the job that Jim Harbaugh has done in, before in the past. Uh, and if you look at the Chargers, the last three coaching hires they've had – have all had one thing in common. Can anybody out there tell me what that one thing in common the Chargers' last three head coaches have had in common? First thing that comes to mind is maybe no prior NFL head coaching experience or maybe even assistant coaching experience. Exactly. None of them had ever been a head coach. Now they've got Jim Harbaugh, who's not only a head coach, he's been a National Football League head coach. He's and been he's to a Super together. Bowl. Yes, exactly right. So, you know, you know, you've got Kansas City here that's going to be playing for a three-peat, and there's going to be a lot of pressure on Kansas City this football season here. If they don't win the AFC West, I'm going to go on record and saying the L.A. Chargers will. That's how I wanted to set the table here, guys. But uh, 
Uh, let, let's start it off, Tony, here. What's your thought here on the upcoming NFL football season? What are your first takes on the 2024 season? All right, let me unmute myself because I'm typing. Uh, I mean, look, I think that the, uh, the NFC North is the best division, most competitive, and that replaces the AFC East. Uh, because I believe that the uh, Jets still have an uphill climb to see what what they actually have with Rodgers going. I absolutely could join that fray with Miami and Buffalo. And I think Buffalo obviously takes a step backward, uh, and the Patriots are in a rebuilding year. But in the NFC North, you've got four teams that you, could, you have to worry about, uh, and they'll all go at one another, and their fan bases are all passionate about hating one another. So looking forward to see how that shakes out, looking forward to see uh, who ends up as Minnesota's quarterback. Is it going to be a, a, a rookie right out of the gate or will they go with, with a, a stopgap in zach wilson um so uh, you know uh, no not zach wilson because he's in denver uh, the uh the guy that they have there from last year um, sam donald or sam uh, mullins and then they also have them sam donald that's worry um and so so from from that standpoint you've got then you got the bears and then you've got the, the the two teams that we've seen succeed in the postseason in detroit and green bay so uh that I mean, so much really remains to be seen. I like what Philadelphia did, and I think that because of the way last season ended, um, they're going to they're they're going to come out of the gates fast. And in, in from a, from the standpoint of taking every game seriously, but how do how do you replace a Jason Kelsey? Uh, you know, I, I, their their uh, brotherly shove not no longer going to be as effective. Uh, as it has been, I think uh, we can all agree that that's going to be the case. Uh, will Jacksonville uh, return to uh, to the, the form that we expected from them last season? Uh, now that they've got a Gabriel Davis uh, to to help Trevor Lawrence, and will Lawrence take that step forward, which is in him? There's no question it is, but he's he's been a disappointment. There's no way to sugarcoat that. Uh, Houston is there a, a slump? For C.J. Stroud in store, or is he just going to hit the ground running? How healthy is Tank Dell coming back from his injury? He got shot in Orlando the other night, which is ridiculous. A little 16-year-old shot up a, a, an unsanctioned party. Thankfully, everybody got out unscathed, and, and Dell's going to be fine. But look, you're 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 in a situation where, yes, the Chiefs are the favorite. I think they'll be stronger probably, but it's it's anybody's game again. You probably got. 12 to 15 teams that feel good about where they are in terms of competing for a Super Bowl. And then you've got another 10 wanting to take that step forward. So really very few teams that go into it knowing that they have no chance and knowing like an Arizona or like a New England that they're going to have to build uh, and and not get too excited or ahead of themselves this season. So uh, again, it's May. It's May, May 1st. Happy May, everybody. But, uh, you know, so... I, I, I take everything I say about football with a grain of salt, but uh, there are things to take to be excited about. Greg, uh, let me, before I hand this off to you, Tony brought out a point and it uh, sort of kindled a piece of interest of me about the Deshaun Watson Houston trade. And the last time I looked, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, on this, the Houston Texans right now are a lower favorite to make the Super Bowl than are the Cleveland Browns. Considerably. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that little program up, and it's not to say that Browns are devoid of talent. I mean, they were allowed or able to make moves in the football draft because they're so deeply talented football team here. So they this are. is more or less an exclamation. I'm sorry. No, they are, Mark, and that's why I'm shocked that they're forty to one to win the Super Bowl. Just shocked. I mean, well, can, yeah, even, I think there's a, there's a ton of mind, money. And, and I'm going to just agree, disagree slightly with what Tony said as far as the best division in football last year. I think you'd have to give strong consideration to the AFC North as opposed to the AFC East. All four teams in that division finished with winning records, which is, um, yeah, I saw the stat. Well, it's the first time since 1934 that all teams in the division, that the last place team in the division had a winning record. Well, of course, back then you had seven, eight team divisions when you just had east and west and all that but in the in the era of uh, you know four division teams cincinnati 
with the injuries uh, to Burrow and all, nine and eight. You had ten and seven with Pittsburgh, eleven and six with Cleveland, and Baltimore thirteen and four. And of course, remember what's important about that is these teams each play six games against their other division rivals, so they accumulated a lot of wins in their non-division play. I think Cleveland still has uh, as much talent, but they're also in what was last year and could again this year be the best and by that i also mean most balanced division and you know if you got a last place team with a winning record that speaks to balance i agree with that greg i know you're a big value player you look for value you mentioned the cleveland browns being 40 to 1. any other plays that you're looking at in the national football league that look mighty appealing to greg de palma right now well uh if I use the strategy of going through, say, futures right now, then I might say, well, I don't think I'm going to get much of a break for teams that I would like, like Detroit, Cincinnati, 12-1, to 13-1. to 1. That probably won't move, so why would I put money on it now? But I definitely would like those teams in September. Um, so where, where else would I go? Well, it starts with the Eagles and the Packers, because now the Eagles get to come back after a disappointing season. They still have a loaded roster and a better uh, a, a assortment of assistant coaches would hurt them last year. Uh, Green Bay, I mean, how do you look at what they did last year in outplaying San Francisco and losing that game and not thinking that they're going to be better this year? And then with the higher teams like Cleveland, you got the Chargers with Herbert and a coaching staff at 30 to 1. You have the Rams getting disrespected at 35 to 1. Uh, we talked about Cleveland, and then if you want to go even further than that, I mean, how many times are people going to disrespect the Steelers at 60 to 1? Uh, Seattle's at 75 to 1, and they've got a really good roster and a new coaching staff. Um, so I think those are the teams that I would be looking at early before those odds drop, because I can't imagine Cleveland won't go off somewhere around 25 to 1 when it's all said and done. So I jump all over Cleveland, the Chargers, the Rams. Jacksonville 45 to 1, Pittsburgh, Seattle. I think those are all realistic teams that have a shot to win the Super Bowl. Um, and I'm not just throwing money away, like, say, Tampa Bay. I like the story of Tampa Bay, but they're not going to win a Super Bowl, even though they're 75 to 1. So I think you do have to be a little bit realistic. But yeah, I think those are the teams that. that uh, and what's the fun is, is that there's a lot of. But with the Chiefs winning back to back Super Bowls, the, the chances of them winning a third are just a lot smaller. It just doesn't happen. San Francisco is going to potentially have the, 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 the old uh, lose Super Bowl, have a bad next season deal. So that opens things up tremendously for all these other teams to have a realistic shot. Well, I wish Jim Feist were with us, and Jim couldn't make it, guys, on the show. Uh, he has family matters that he's attending to, and obviously Victor King, he's been off for the summer here, also attending to some family matters, and everybody will be back intact in July, Victor, Jim, and the crew here today for our next Against the Spread podcast, uh, as we do just that. But I would be interested to know what Jim's take on the National Football League would be. I know Jim maybe not so much of a futures player as he is what's going on here today, but uh, we'll catch up with him in July to find out his take on everything that's going on. Andy, your take. You can wrap it up here and close it out here uh, on the National Football League side of things. What is going to catch or what has caught your interest thus far? Well, as I talked about during our discussion on the draft, I like the Chargers. I like their, their odds at 30 to 1. I will admit up front, uh, right after the Super Bowl, within, uh, within minutes of the Super Bowl landing, I did play Kansas City to get that three-peat simply because those odds were never going to be better than the nine-to-one that they were listed at, I believe was at Circa within 15 minutes of the uh, completion of the Super Bowl. But I think if there's a team that can challenge them, I like all the changes that they've made. We talked about their draft. Um, I like the Chargers at 30-to-one. Now, I can't, I've can't. i not made any other plays yet other than those two. But the thing to keep in mind is, and that's where uh, another few weeks we'll know the NFL schedule. And what I'll be looking at, you want to take a look at the sequencing of the games. I want to take a look at the quality teams that have a very difficult first five or six games. Might end up, say, four and two, possibly even three and three. But let's say four and two, and those are teams whose odds might drop by the time we get to the middle of October. They might be 11 to one now. They might be 18 to one because they're four and two, and that you know may put them out of the possibility of winning their division and getting a playoff bye, even though we'll, at, at the, that point there'll still be 11 games remaining. So I mean, you take a look. I'm looking at, at the Westgate right now, and you see odds. 49ers, 9-2. to two. 
Uh, Ravens eight to one, Chiefs six to one, even the Bills at fourteen to one. Now uh, you you may be able to get better odds because you might find a reason to like several of the teams that have a chance once you get into October and the odds are a lot generous. As I say, the Chargers are thirty to one now. I don't know that they're going to be any lower, but I'd be happy to take thirty to one, which I was. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, or that I'm looking at, teams like Buffalo. All that playoff experience and the disappointing results. I wonder if they might not be due for a bit of a decline this year. And a lot of that has to do with Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. Now, that's only two games, but it's two games. And, of course, I think the team split last year when the, uh, the Jets actually came back on that Monday night when Rodgers was injured and, uh, and they won in overtime in that game. But those extra games over the course of four or five years take an awful big toll on a lot of teams. And that's why we see very often a lot of these teams – all of a sudden go into somewhat of a decline. The ones that don't are the ones that make a lot of changes while they're in that period of excellence, like a team we've seen Kansas City under. Look, they traded away uh, the best uh, uh, receiver in football, and here they are back in the playoffs every year. Now they've got some personnel changes from last year as well. So uh, my, my thoughts right now, the best value out there for me was the Chargers, but there may be other good values. We'll have a little bit of a better idea. I'll have a little bit of a better idea once the schedule is out and we get to chart the course for all 32 teams as far as the easy, the difficult, you know, the road trips, etc., consecutive division games, etc., all of which we'll be able to do. We know all the opponents home and road. We don't know the sequencing until that schedule comes out, and that's when I start to see, think seriously about NFL future plays as far as multiple teams and be prepared for the early part of the season as to decide when to get on when, when to get in on those teams well that's when we'll be checking the boxes guys and uh this has been a great little overview preview if you will from the college football draft to the national football league 2024 season here uh also i want to remind listeners out there prime time or prime sports network greg does a terrific horse racing show amongst all, a bunch of other things that he does but it's kentucky derby week guys and you're going to want to Check out Greg's Kentucky Derby show with John Hardoon and Chad Summers. Excellent handicapper, excellent trainer. Check that out on the Prime Sports Network. Uh, you can do that on YouTube. Any other way that they can do that, Greg? Uh, yeah, we'll actually uh, stream it out so you can get it on cool. uh, Apple and all those other streaming services. And uh, cool. we have a new horse racing channel, um, Horsepower PSN, uh, so they can check that out directly. And you can get a link on that on the bottom of the Prime Sports Network website uh, channel. Cool. Well, guys, this has been brought to you by uager.lv, as you mentioned, featuring 5% rebates, monthly rebates uh, to their customers. Check it out at uager.lv or call them toll free at 1-800-UWager. And once again, if you like what we're doing, hit the like button down below. And if you have any questions or comments, hit the subscribe button and we'll be glad to answer and get back with you. So for Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Tony Mejia, playbook experts and sporting news contributing writer, Greg De Palma, producer of Prime Sports Network, Jim Feist, Victor King, this is Mark Lawrence until July, reminding you to always remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always.